All right. Anybody left out there in the hall? Come on in. We have some seats up front. Anybody? <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. Hope everyone's having an amazing Dreamforce day one here. Um, I am Mars Hall. And I'm Trevor Scott. We're, uh, we're both customer-facing architects. We work under uh, AppCloud with Heroku specifically. So uh, today, we're going to be making some forward-looking statements. And uh, the important part is that customers who purchase our services should, not, should make purchase decisions based upon features that are currently available. What we're going to be showing you today, it could, you could consider a preview. You're going to get uh, a URL where you can download a build pack. This is pre-release software. Trevor. All right. So to start things off today, um, I'd like to give a brief introduction of machine learning. So I'll start with the definition. Um, so machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Um, another definition I like is it's the study of algorithms that improve their performance at some task with experience. Uh, really the gist here is that uh, it's machines making predictions or decisions from data. Before we dive any deeper, I'd like to maybe get to know you guys a little bit better. Um, if you're a developer, could you raise your hand? Awesome. Do we have any uh, mathematicians or statisticians in the room? We have one. All right, two. <laughs> um, any, anyone here ever done some machine learning? Awesome. Um, anyone here a data scientist? Just a few. All right. Sweet. I wanted to share this um, diagram because uh, it kind of gives you an idea of where machine learning fits in the umbrella of data science. Um, and also, it kind of lets you know that there's, there's a lot to data science. There's several different fields, and you need a lot of skills to do this work. Also, you might ask, if you're just learning about machine learning, you know, uh, why do we care about it? What can it do for us? Um, what can it do for my business? And really, machine learning adds value because there's computer power is really cheap and available right now. And it, it can create models a lot quicker than a human can. So we should just let the machines do the work for us for this predictive modeling. Um, and some of the applications for your business, you know, there's, there's tons of applications of machine learning out there. Um, in financial services, there's fraud detection. In healthcare, there's improved diagnoses. In marketing and sales, you know, there's a lot of e-commerce recommendation engines out there. Um, and even in research, in say bi biology, you know, you can use machine learning to identify cell phenotypes. So to better understand machine learning, I'd like to talk about the different types of problems that you can solve. Um, there's three main categories of machine learning. They are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And with, um, <clears throat> with supervised learning, you start with labeled data. And so given an object, you want to, you want to give um, some label to it. And you have some desired output that you're trying to achieve. And a couple types of supervised learning are classification and regression. We'll talk about those in a, a little bit. Uh, with unsupervised learning, it's, it's not as, um, it's a little bit different. Um, so data is not labeled. And really, a model is trying to find the hidden structure in the data. Um, and the, uh, a couple types of unsupervised learning are clustering and association. And the last type is uh, reinforcement learning, where the model is it's trying to take actions um, in an environment and, try, and trying to maximize some sort of reward, usually. And uh, examples of that are, are usually in robotics or navigation or gaming. So to talk about supervised learning a little bit more, um, with classification, th there's a couple different types of supervised learning. And uh, the main ones are classification and regression. Uh, with classification, you have discrete outputs. You're usually trying to take an object and, and classify it, put it into a group. An example there would be uh, given a shape, uh, trying to classify it as a triangle or a circle. With regression, it's a little bit different. Um, you have continuous outputs. So given attributes of a home, say, 
um, you know, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, square feet. You're trying to predict maybe um, a continuous value, say its price or something like that. With unsupervised learning, um, so you're not given um, any sort of labeled output. You're not trying to achieve a labeled output. So given, given data, you, you don't know what it's going to be classified as. And usually a model will try to cluster it together or try to group things together and find its like hidden structure. Uh, an example of this would be kind of, so if you had a bunch of images of animals, uh, you could, a model might try to cluster them together into different groups of their respective animal types. So I wanted to share this with you as well. Um, it really shows that we've barely scratched the surface of all the different types of machine learning. There's a lot more out there. I'd like to talk about a little bit of the, um, what a typical machine learning flow looks like. It all starts with the data. And um, you can get this data from a number of different places. You can get it from, uh, you know, running queries in your database. Maybe it's coming from um, Kafka, in, or maybe you download it off the web. Um, and that's raw data. And when, you have to take that raw data and you have to work with it. You have to clean it. You have, there's usually missing, um, missing parts of the data. You have to clean it up and get it ready for training. Uh, and once you've prepared your data, you, you usually set aside certain data for training and certain data for evaluation. Um, and then once you have the data all, all ready to go, uh, you perform a training on an algorithm. Um, and training and validation are really where the most, they're the most demanding of, of computer, computing power. Um, so given like a million rows of data, um, you, and an algorithm, sometimes you're not even able to do that on a single machine. Um, so once you train, train your model, um, you, you want to use some sort of validation process to make sure that it's actually predicting things correctly. It's actually performing the way that you intended it. Um, and then once you've validated it, you can start using it. So a lot of us are developers here, and we want to start using technology, and we want to start getting out there and actually do machine learning. Um, and Mars is about to talk about uh, Prediction I.O., which is kind of a machine learning framework. And you should just know that Prediction I.O. is built on a couple different technologies, uh, namely Apache Spark, which is a distrib distributed data processing platform for cluster computing. It's kind of the workhorse behind machine learning. Um, it spreads tasks across a cluster of computers. And there's also Spark ML, which is an uh, algorithm library um, that Prediction IO leverages. And um, yeah, Mars is going to talk a little bit more about pr Prediction IO. Right on. Thank you, Trevor. So um, that flow for machine learning that Trevor just presented is a uh, there's a lot of ways that you might execute that kind of flow. A lot of custom software might need to be built. Well, Prediction I.O. is a framework that lets you, that actually gives you a model for how to structure this intake, this ingest of events, and then processing it in different ways in order to answer different types of queries about it. So in the Prediction I.O. model, we have um, the orange circles off to the left are your event producers. So those might be your mobile applications on uh, iOS or websites, um, as well as different types of metrics coming from, in this case, email campaigns. And so Prediction I.O. provides essentially two different pieces, the event server and the engine. And the event server is the ingest point. So all your different applications will be sending via JSON over HTTP events to this event server. And then your engines end up being configured in order to uh, use slices of those events out of the event server. So Prediction I.O., one of the great things about it is that it comes with uh, a gallery of engine templates. So these templates provide uh, implementations for some very common use cases. Classification 
and recommendation. Um, based on Trevor's explanation, this would be uh, supervised and unsupervised learning models are both supported pretty much out of the box. So what does this really do for you? This lets you as a developer really focus on the data science aspects of it. So kind of like Ruby on Rails let you focus on building like the interesting, unique part of your web application. Prediction I.O. lets you focus on building the, the interesting, really unique parts of your ML application. Also, having this common structure with the engines uh, helps improve collaboration. So different developers can more easily comprehend what other developers have made in this regard. They can share engines, they can collaborate much more easily. And finally, because Prediction I.O. uses Apache Spark underneath the hood, um, it's really simple to get it up and running on a, a, a small like, developer-sized instance or even on your local computer, and then uh, run a cluster of Spark and attach those same engines to a cluster. Hey, if you folks in the back want to come in further, there are still some seats up here and make room for everyone, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So what is this engine? What is this framework? So Prediction I.O. calls it DAYS. So it's the Data Algorithm Serving and Evaluation. Um, so this flow chart, I guess it's a little blurry here. But uh, we'll go in a little deeper, actually look at some code here in just a moment. But uh, these, these pieces of the framework, you could think of them as like controllers of different aspects of this pipeline for your ML data flow. Um, the data part is where you extract that data from the event server. Actually, Prediction I.O. isn't just for their event server. You can, actually, you can also attach it directly to, say, a Postgres database. If you're using Heroku Connect, you can actually uh, pull in data directly from Salesforce that way. Um, and so in that data phase, you'll also be doing what's called preparing the data, which might be massaging attribute values, uh, replacing null values maybe with means. Like, there's all different things that you might do to make your data, massage it so that your, uh, the algorithm that you choose to use can uh, give you better predictions. So then there's the algorithm. So an engine can support Obviously, one algorithm, but one of the really interesting aspects with Prediction I.O. is that you can load multiple algorithms into a single engine so that in the serving phase, uh, as queries are coming in, you can actually have logic about querying different algorithms and perhaps combining their predictions or picking the best one, depending upon, once again, how you actually structure what, what questions you're trying to answer. And finally, there's evaluation. And so evaluation is a reoccurring part uh, throughout the life cycle of an engine. And evaluation is where you uh, tune the engine. You, you use what's called a k-fold process to separate your data and train the engine on part of the data and then validate it uh, using another slice of data. And uh, in this evaluation phase, Prediction I.O. automates uh, testing different sets of parameters iteratively and then picking the best one for you. All right, so now let's, uh, let's see if the internet gods are gonna be friendly. Um, so, Prediction I.O., here we're gonna show you what it looks like to be uh, deploying this on Heroku. So, how many of you folks are familiar with Heroku? Yay! <laughs> um, for those of you that are not yet familiar with Heroku, let me just say there's a lot of great resources here, uh, various sessions going from basic introductions to really deep dives into some great technology available. But the, uh, the punchline is that Heroku lets developers focus on deploying apps without worrying about the infrastructure, and it provides an amazing developer experience uh, that supports tremendous collaboration and quality control through the life cycle of the applications. 
All right, and so what are we gonna be deploying today? I'm gonna scroll up to the top here. This is a GitHub repo that is currently open sourced. It was just open sourced last week. Um, so this is the prediction IO uh, event server and engine combined into a single build pack. You can deploy all of it from here. Um, we're not actually going to step through this whole deployment flow. Uh, I'll leave that up to you, but we will jump in to git push Heroku master, and you'll be able to see what our actual workflow looks like with this engine. All right, so uh, let's see here. Can we see this okay? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, actually, I'll just show you here. Where are we? So this is the engine. I just essentially cloned this Git repo. So if you look at these files, here we have readme, uh, proc file engine, app.json. Uh, here we've got Oh, actually, this is, this is the engine repo, sorry. That's a confusing point, but. Uh, so when you're actually performing this deployment, there will be two different aspects you deploy. You have to deploy the event server, which attaches, in this case, to a Postgres database, and then the actual engine. And so in this case, we're gonna be demonstrating uh, deploying a classification engine. And this engine is a very naive engine. It's a naive Bayes algorithm. Um, it's easy for us to demo. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to go into a deep model here. So this is a, a pretty good comprehensible introduction. And this engine has its own repo. If you follow through those instructions, it will, uh, it will guide you through how to get this. So here you can see we have engine.json, and when we look here, uh, this is the repo we're actually in. So we're gonna git push Heroku master. So this is the standard Heroku deployment process. Um, it uses git as the, uh, essentially to create snapshots that then are built in the Heroku platform and deployed to the runtime where they're given a web address. So this is gonna take a few minutes. Um, We'll come back to it. We're not just gonna watch the logs flow. So, th by the way, prediction IO engines are written in Scala, uh, which is a JVM-based language, so most of what's gonna be happening here is running SBT, the Scala build tool, and it just takes a couple minutes. Um, so while that's happening, let's take a look at this engine. So this is the actual source code, um, and here in our source main area is the bulk of the engine. And you can see these pieces that I mentioned earlier. Here's our data source, um, here is our algorithm, and then we also have serving and evaluation. So if you look at data source, you'll see it's just standard Scala code. And it's it's a really simple API to build against. Essentially, you set up uh, methods on classes that take the Spark context, which is whether, whether you're running against a single instance of Spark, like on your own machine, or a Spark cluster, this is the driver that lets this piece of software talk to Spark. So essentially, like in this case, this method gets a Spark context, and then it actually queries the event server in order to get um, essentially users with these attributes, service plan, voice usage, data usage, text usage. So let's just check real quick. Yep, it's flying by, still working there. All right, so uh, a few other of these aspects. Um, so there's the data source. So as far as the algorithms go, this is one of the interesting things. Trevor mentioned uh, that Prediction IO leverages Spark ML. So Spark ML is essentially an open source library of a lot of really well proven uh, data analysis algorithms, machine learning algorithms. 
And in this case, we're importing the naive Bayes algorithm. And it's very simple to run in this context. You can see training. All training does is it gets the Spark context and the data, and then it, and then it uses Spark ML's uh, naive Bayes train function directly. And then predicting is also very similar. Um, in this case, it calls out to, um, let's see here. I think it's actually in a different place. I'm not sure. But they're, actually, in this case, using these models, it's just a very direct mapping. But in your own use cases, you'll probably start to discover that as you, as you make queries and try to get really good answers, you're going to find that just a raw algorithm doesn't really answer the questions. You have to start figuring out ways to, say, aggregate properties and create new features based on combinations of attributes and, once again, maybe even use multiple algorithms for different, as different facets of your data. So this is just the base framework. All right, so now our release has been made. Um, you can see here that Heroku deploys and gives us a web address. Um, I will be showing you this query here in a moment. We'll be querying this interface here in just a moment. I'm just going to tail the logs on this app. And uh, OK, we can see that the engine has already come up. But I want to show you this kind of mess of text in here. Um, this is actually prediction I.O. calling out to Spark. So fundamentally, once again, this is a framework for helping you manipulate these queries and these long-running processes that actually run in Spark. All right, so let's take a quick look at the data. So when we deployed the engine, it automatically, uh, or sorry, when, we, when you go through that build pack, one of the steps is to import data. So for an engine like this, we have, um, we have a little set of data. It's just 150 records that we train with in order to do this demonstration. For your own use case, you'll immediately want to start plugging in your own data. Like, for tinkering, this is cool, right? But, but this data isn't going to tell me anything about my own customer data. So this you could think of as a very good reference kind of entry point for how to start mapping your customers' like attributes and properties into a machine learning model. So in this case, what our data looks like is the first column is a service plan ID. We just have three service plans. And then uh, we have three more columns of data. And those are voice usage, data usage, text usage. And uh, the way that that data actually looks, here's a distribution of it. So this is service plan one. As you can see, our voice levels, the max is almost 2,000, and the average is above 500 minutes, whereas the other um, types of usage are low. And then correspondingly, we have the same high data usage, and then on plan three, high text usage. All right, so with that in place, we can query the engine. And let me just point out in our readme, in the readme, we talk a little bit about what's happening here. Um, I'm actually just going to take these queries and run them directly. So let me make sure. Got this set up. OK. So if I just paste in this curl command. So if you're not familiar with curl, it's pretty much the standard command line HTTP tool. So what this is going to do is send an HTTP request to our Heroku engine, uh, to our prediction I.O. engine running on Heroku to its queries.json endpoint. And we're going to ask it for a, an unseen user, for a new piece of data with voice usage of 480, data usage of zero, and text usage of 121, what service plan does it fit? And so it tells us one. Yay. 
Um, we can do the same with some other parameters. Here's one with higher data usage. Or sorry, that one actually has the highest text usage. And you can see it actually fit us into, of course, um, the third service plan. So the important thing to realize here, of course, if you're all developers, you're thinking, I could just write some logic that would figure that out, right? But the point is that you're not writing that logic. You are using the data to shape how the model actually makes these recognitions. Um, so as you actually continue refining your engine, um, there's a, one of the really interesting pieces of the life cycle is the evaluation. So I mentioned that earlier in terms of being able to um, tune an engine, see how different parameters work. So here I'm going to run what we call a one-off on Heroku. And what this does is this is going to give us a command line terminal uh, into our engine. And so you could think of it like SSHing, except we're not actually connecting to a running server. It's, Heroku is actually starting a, a whole new server for us just to run our query on. So here I'm going to uh, use this evaluation, which is explained in the custom readme. And in this case, uh, once again, that's a big old spark submit command. And what this is doing is rerunning the training with different parameters each time. And then it gives us a best parameter output. So what we see here is we have these different iterations. So iteration 0, 1. And you can see in the case of the naive Bayes engine, we only have one parameter we're changing. It's called the lambda. And this is the data smoothing parameter. Uh, I, am, I am too far in the danger zone to be able to explain in depth what that smoothing parameter does. Um, but in this case, because of how this data has been structured, it actually has very little effect. So in this case, we're seeing that because of probably something with our data, differences to this parameter on the engine actually have no effect. So where would you go from here, right? What would be the next step? So getting more data, uh, figuring out ways to get more facets of data. Obviously, telling people what service plan they fit isn't really just based on three things. And so as you add more attributes to your, uh, to your events and start using them in your algorithms, you'll probably find that you need once again, to try different algorithms. And so in this case, you know, we're using naive Bayes. And one of the problems with the naive Bayes algorithm is that it only looks at features completely independently. It doesn't pick up correlations of features. So in this case, like it recognizes, oh, this is like a high voice usage or high data usage. But I couldn't expect naive Bayes to pick up that like all three of the things were low usage. I would have to create a new meta feature that perhaps combines those and adds another data point, which is a score about the combination of the, those usages. But then you can also look at other algorithms. So this particular algorithm called random forests, um, prediction IO actually, if you go through their readmes or a quick start on the actual prediction IO site, you'll find that for their classifier demo, they start leading you into random forests. And it is a more complex algorithm with more parameters to, to, to tune. And uh, this would be a case where maybe you would run the naive Bayes algorithm and then alongside it also add the random forest algorithm. So I hope that uh, y'all are inspired to go try this out. Um, let's see here. Right, so I hope you all are inspired to go try this out. We are going to have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, please ask for a microphone and. Hand up if you have a question. Anyone at the back, question? Oh. 
Hello. Hello. Uh, so you showed that we need to use Scala language for programming the evaluation and so on. Uh, is it possible to use also different uh, languages? Um, so Scala, Python is supported, although really the Scala, the Scala language is the first class prediction I.O. experience. Um, Python is supported in some contexts, but you're really, it's really all about Scala. Um, so yes. what, what are some interesting um, classification or regression problem that you guys solved in Heroku that are interesting? That you guys... <laughs> um, well, one of the things earlier this year that they were working on was uh, predicting problems with apps that are running on the Heroku platform. So what combinations of factors create you know, the right trajectory for saying an app is going to suffer performance-wise? Um, after, I think it took, I think it, they spent about three months working on that and ended up abandoning it because they found that we could produce a better feature by allowing our customers to set thresholding levels for alerting as opposed to trying to predict things. Because people really want to, like in that use case context, they really want to have confidence that they're going to get the right alerts at the right time and not receive noise. Um, but yeah, we're really just at the beginning of this journey inside of Heroku. Uh, hi. So I played around with Prediction now a little bit uh, using uh, deploying it as a Docker on uh, AWS. What's the difference between doing that and using Heroku? I've not used Heroku before, so just wanted to ask that. Uh, the difference between deploying with Docker on AWS versus Heroku. Um, so really the biggest difference here is going to be the, the DX, the developer experience. You have to figure out AWS. You have to figure out Docker, put those pieces together, figure out the security settings, and monitor it, make sure it stays up, patch your systems. Heroku does all of that for you. Plus, it gives you an amazing team-based uh, deployment pipeline system uh, for uh, reviewing like changes to your apps through pull, uh, pull requests and uh, running continuous integration tests, all that kind of stuff. So, but you know, for doing experiments and for learning, it, it really doesn't matter. Just figure it out and get into it, right? <laughs> so yeah, I've got a question just going back to um, the Scala uh, requirement. Um, am I right in making the assumption to get started, you don't necessarily need to know Scala? I mean, I, if you want to use it out of the box and say, I just want to use Naive Bayes, I saw there's some very simple configuration, and then you're just essentially making these uh, um, post requests with a JSON payload to go and get a result, mm -hmm. right? So you, um, but if you want to get really stuck into it, you'd need a Scala development team, do you think? Uh -huh. Is that right? Or? Um, so yeah, for prediction I/O, it's all the engines are based in Scala. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you don't need to be a Scala expert to deploy this engine and start actually having a working model. So um, and also, I'd like to mention that with uh, with Spark ML, with the, the algorithm library, it supports other languages okay. like Python and R. Right. Okay. Thank you. You want to add anything? Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question uh, related to uh, deep learning. Um, so one of the things which is happening in the world is uh, GPU-based processing, right? Uh, does your platform support uh, GPU-based where I could run something on NVIDIA and then you know, get a better performance? Uh, some kind of a test bed where I could, you know, I have already have a training set and you can just you know, put it there and then see how it performs and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really great point. Um, Today, our platform, we don't have dyno types that are specific to, uh, to machine learning or to giving you specific features like that. 
Um, this is an ever-present question with the Heroku platform internally. We're always like, when are we going to get types with more memory? When are we going to get SSD back types? Um, and so all I can say is that it's, it's, a known, it's a known challenge that we want to support more types, and hopefully, hopefully they'll appear. What are the limits of the data sets that you can feed, and uh, can you describe a little bit about the costs involved for deploying? So what we have demonstrated today is, uh, is a, it's a very simple uh, demonstration of prediction I.O. that runs in what we call the common runtime. So the common runtime in Heroku is uh, the public cloud. So we also support Heroku Enterprise private spaces. Um, and with private spaces, you can do much more uh, sophisticated things with, with clusters of, of instances. But this build pack is based on deploying on a single dyno in the common runtime. And so you are limited to the, the largest instance size that we, um, that we support, which is called a Performance L, and it has 14 gigabytes of RAM on it. So once you need to go beyond something that will fit in, you know, reasonably fit in 14 gigs of Spark processing space, and Spark is all about processing data in memory, right? And so as soon as you hit that limit on Heroku, there you'll have to figure out what is the next step? And it could be, um, you know, if you're, if you're part of Heroku Enterprise, um, there, it's, it's possible that there, there's, there will be, you know, sp better Spark support, like clustering support. Uh, we don't have that product today, but this is an entry point for being able to see how it works, get a sense for the experience. Um, really, there's a, there's a lot to be, to be learned in as much as just getting your hands on it and seeing, you know, hey, what is the shape of my data? How does the model handle this? And getting to the point where you actually need distributed Spark is, is probably, it's not an instant thing. Like, before you start processing that much data, you're going to need to get some practice with smaller data sets anyway. Performance L's are, are a charge service, so they're $16 a day, $500 a month, yeah. But to, to make the point though, this demo that we're running, the web process, which is the engine that is serving queries, that, that is the less intensive part of the engine, and it's actually running on a 2x dyno, which is only a gig of RAM and it's much less expensive. That might be $50 a month. I can't remember what the price is of that one. Um, and then we have our training process set to use a performance L. So just when it does training, it will use the bigger size dyno, and then when it's done training, that turns back off and you're not charged for it. What's that? Um, yeah, so let's see here. Does it come with Heroku like that, that uh, it uses the more gigs for the training, or do you have to configure that yourself? So uh, by default, your Heroku app is going to run on free dynos, unless you're in an enterprise org, in which case it automatically requires some higher level dynos. But uh, when you deploy it uh, for free, you'll and you tail the logs, you'll immediately see that there are going to be memory, memory alerts, um, which don't necessarily kill the app immediately. It depends on how over the memory quota you are. But this is the recommended uh, scaling, which is uh, what I just mentioned. So it's a 2x that runs constantly. And then the release phase and train both have performance Ls, which those are short-lived processes that just run around deployments. All right. So thank you so much for uh, hanging out and chatting about ML today. Go check out that build pack that we linked to in the slides. Totally. If you'd like to get started on some machine learning. <laughs> Have a beautiful Dreamforce. <laughs>